Hello from the Forstronics YouTube channel and welcome to Electrical Signal Routing with Mechanical Relays and this will be part one in a two-part series. Before I get started, I'll just mention please check me out on Patreon where you can get some exclusive content from my videos, whether that's design files for hardware designs, code, bombs, uh, special videos, and of course from this video series there will be some exclusive content for Patreon as well. Also, if you haven't already, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, and if you like what you see here, please hit the thumbs up. All right, let's get started. Okay, so I'm actually gonna do two series here. I'm gonna first start with mechanical relays, and then I'm gonna go on to solid state switches. And there'll probably be, there's gonna be two parts for mechanical relays and maybe two or three parts for solid state switches. But I wanted to cover, you know, all the way to control signal routing in your design using you know electrical signals. So I'm not talking about manual switches here. These are switches we can control with electrical signals. And of course, I'm gonna cover different types of switches, the pros and cons, what are good applications for certain types of switches, and then also the circuit designs to implement the switches, right? Because typically you can't just use them out of the box and plug them right in and all of a sudden you have a switch. Okay, for this series, I just wanna do a quick comparison of mechanical relays versus solid state relays. And each one has its pros and cons and it's good for certain target applications and the other one could be better. Personally, I typically try to go with solid state switches for a lot of the advantages I list there. No hot switching, and I'll talk about what hot switching is, but that's a mechanical relay thing. No switch bounce, which is another mechanical relay phenomenon, which I'll talk about. Solid state switches can often be lower cost they can have a longer life. If you use solid state switches within their specs, I mean, they essentially last forever, and they often have a smaller footprint. Mechanical relays, their big advantage is they actually create an air gap between signal paths, right? So for safety applications, for applications where you wanna make sure there's no leakage current or anything like that, mechanical relays are the way to go. Another aspect about mechanical relays is they're bi-directional. Right, you can send signals through each direction, positive signals, negative signals. Sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes that's a bad thing, depending on your application. With solid state switches, they have to be biased correctly to get the right signal through. And of course, we'll talk about that more in the solid state switches series. But let's move on and let's focus on mechanical relays for the rest of the video. So here's some remote mechanical relays some of the options and some of the different types. And this, this list is not meant to be exhaustive, but I just wanted to share some of the common ones that are used out there. The most common ones are armature relays and reed relays. And these range in different power, voltage, and current levels. Armature relays are typically made to handle higher voltages and current than reed relays. The advantage of reed relays though is they're often smaller and faster. So if you want to engage closing the switch or opening the switch, they have less of a delay than armature relays, but their power handling capabilities is typically not as high as armature relays. Another common switch out there is typically referred to as the contactor. So this is, a lot of people are familiar with this if you work with high powered AC, because that's often where they're used. But when a contactor closes, you can hear it. They're pretty loud and they're made to handle high power. On the bottom left is a mercury switch. And there's a lot of different types of mercury switch. The one I'm showing on the bottom is a fairly high powered one. And I think that's actually a contactor as well. But what's special about mercury switches is they have liquid mercury in them. And by using liquid mercury in the switch, you can eliminate things like switch bounce. You also can control the orientation of the switch, meaning the switch can open or close based on the position of the mercury. You also get longer switch life because you can hot switch with mercury switches and it's not as damaging. And once again, we'll talk about hot switching soon. There's the tilt switch, which is almost like a sensor. And a tilt switch could be a mercury switch or it could not be, but the idea is the tilt switch basically based on its orientation will either open or close. And so it's more of like a safety type switch. And then lastly, I list RF switches or microwave switches or high frequency switches. This one is made to be used outside a PCB. You can see on the left, it has its post to use power and digital control of the, the actuators inside the switch. And then it has SMA or 3.5 millimeter connections, but you can also get high frequency switches that mount right on PCBs. 
So that's an example of some of the more common mechanical switches out there. And through the rest of this, we're going to focus more on armature relays and read relays. So it's important to know common mechanical relay configurations and terminology. And this is useful if you're trying to research a part for your design. And the reason is, is when you do parts research, it's going to use these terms when you look at switches or relays. So over on the left, we have the simplest type of switch is a single pole, single throw switch. And you'll see that abbreviated as SPST, single pole, single throw. And there's two types of single pole, single throw switches. There's form A and form B. Form A is normally open, meaning the switch in its default state is open and you have to apply electrical signal to it to close. Form B is the opposite. It's normally closed and you have to apply an electrical signal for it to open. And a lot of times you'll see that as form A or NO for normally open or form B or NC for normally closed. And you can think of applications for these, right? Like let's say you're controlling a motor or solenoid that's only on sometimes. Well, you're typically going to go with a form A switch because it's normally open. Let's say you're monitoring a power supply and you would only want to open it or shut it off if there's some type of safety issue. Well, a form B is a good switch for that because once you turn on the design, the switch is already closed and power can flow. Moving to the right, we have the single pole double throw switch or SPDT. This type of switch is single pole once again, single pole meaning there's only one signal path, but it's double throw, meaning in each position, it connects to another signal path. There's no open condition. It's either closed on one signal path or closed on the other. And this is typically referred to as a form C switch. On the further to the right, we have the double pole single throw switch. So this has two poles or two signal paths but only one position for that signal, or I should say two positions for that signal path, either opened or closed. And that dotted line through it means that the switches are controlled together, meaning they don't operate independently. This is a single switch. When you apply an electrical signal, it closes. When you take away the signal, it's open. And then lastly, we have the double pole double throw. And so this is basically taking two single pole double throw switches and putting them together. So you have two signal paths, the dotted line, once again, means when you change the switch position, both switches or relays move. So they're always in either one signal path or the other. There's never a pure open state. And so this would be an example of two form C switches. Now there's more types. There's more different forms above C. There's more different types of double pole, triple pole, things like that for the switches. But these are the most common. And if you get familiar with these terms, you can sort of start to pick up the other terms as well. Okay, let's look at some theory of operation for our relays. This is my favorite part of the video. So here we have a design for an armature relay diagram. And for these switches, and we'll see this in the read relay as, as well, the way that they're energized is a coil of wire, which is essentially an inductor. We force current through it and it creates a magnetic field and that magnetic field moves metal, which is going to you know, open or close a switch. The armature relay is called an armature relay because of one of the parts in there, this moving arm, almost looks like a boomerang, that's referred to as the armature. So when you apply an electrical signal to the coil, you get electricity flow, it builds up a magnetic field, that magnetic field acts on the armature, either opening or closing the switch. And you can see this switch is an example of a single pole double throw switch, right? Because you have the common here, you have the normally closed and the normally open. So in its default state, it's connected to this path. And when you apply electrical signal, the armature moves up and connects it to this other path. So this is an armature relay, single pole, double throw, or form C. Here's a diagram for a read relay. And so a read relay just basically takes, they refer to these as reeds, but they almost look like paddles. And the idea is a coil is wrapped around it. But this coil works a lot like the armature relay. We shove an electrical signal through here and the magnetic field closes the switch. Now for reed relays, typically you have a higher resistance. So reed relays take less current to actuate them because the parts are smaller. It takes less of a magnetic field where armature relays typically are higher power. So therefore they need a little more current. And this also relates to the aspect about these that I talked about earlier, speed. 
The armature relay takes longer to close and open because it's building up a stronger magnetic field. And so for your inductor to build that magnetic field and for that magnetic field then discharge after power is removed, takes longer in an armature relay compared to a reed relay. That's why reed relays are often known for their speed of how quick they can close and open. All right, I know this slide is a little uh, text heavy, but let's run through from top to bottom. These are important aspects to know when you're doing designs that where you're working with mechanical relays. And a lot of this I've, I've hinted that we're gonna cover. So when you're working with mechanical relays, a lot of times you can get the same type of relay or the same model, but with different voltages to control it. And the most common voltages, these aren't the only voltages, but the most common voltages you'll see out there for controlling magnetic relays, armature and reed relays, is 5 volts, 12 volts, and 24 volts. And the idea is the higher you go in voltage, the less current is needed to actuate the relay. Because basically the different voltage values affects how they design the coil that creates the magnetic field. You know, 5 volts are very common in designs, but if you're going to use 5 volts, you're going to need more current. If you want to use a lot less current, you can go with 24 volts, which is you know, a higher voltage than you find in a lot of electronic designs. So that's sort of the trade-off depending on what type of voltage you want to choose. Hot switching. Hot switching is important in mechanical relays. Hot switching refers to the fact that if a switch is open, you have a voltage potential across one of its terminals, and when it closes, immediately electricity starts to flow through it. You can also do hot switching when you open a switch. So when you, you do hot switching when you open a switch, the switch is closed and electrical current is flowing through it and you open the switch. The reason this is important is because it typically will lower the life of the switch. If you look at a, a mechanical relay's data sheet, they'll often specify its mechanical life, meaning it can you know, cycle 1 million or 10 million times. That's its mechanical life. Then they'll give you its hot switching or lifetime when you have you know, a signal applied to them. And typically they'll show different values. So if you're applying 10 amps, you'll get you know, 100,000 cycles. If you're doing 15 amps, you'll get 50,000 cycles. I'm just making this up. But basically hot switching will wear away the switch quicker and, and break it. If you're doing real low level signals that are very low compared to the switch's specs, then hot switching is not that big of a deal. Also, hot switching will increase the resistance through the switch over time. So a switch is not a perfect short. You have some type of you know, measurable resistance. And the idea is when you hot switch, you get arcing on the switch. So just before the relay closes or the two metal plates meet, there's a little bit of arcing that occurs. And when you open the switch and they first separate, you know, for a split second, you get a little bit of arcing. That arcing leads to burn marks and pitting on the relay plates and so that's what increases the resistance and if you ever use a switch with too high a voltage i can tell you from personal experience what will happen is the switch will often get welded shut so if you're hot switching at a too high a voltage and all of a sudden your switch is no longer working and you notice it's shorted chances are you welded the switch shut switch bounce refers to the fact that when you close a switch you have two metal plates that are basically acted on from a magnetic field and they all of a sudden slam shut. Well, when they slam shut, there's actually, you know, for hundreds of microseconds or milliseconds, there's a little bit of bounce from the, the pressure of them hitting together. So for that first split second, they don't make a reliable contact. So switch bounce is something you need to be aware of. If, if you have something that's really sensitive to the turn on signal, it can cause it to turn on and off. If you're using it, you know, you're switching to control, to control some device or automate some device. And then of course, if you're trying to measure a signal from after you close a switch, you want to make sure the switch bounce wears off before you make the measurement because you don't want it to be off. And the idea here is if you buy mercury relays that have liquid mercury in them, you can avoid switch bounce. Or if you use solid state switches, you can avoid switch bounce. The last topic I want to cover is flyback. We discussed how both reed relays and armature relays have coils in them for a magnetic field. Well, if you know about inductors, right, it takes time for that magnetic field to build up once you apply a current to the coil. And then after you take away the current, you know, the magnetic field doesn't just disappear, right? It starts to collapse and it induces an electrical signal onto the conductor and the coil. So flyback is the phenomenon that when you pull power off a relay, the relay itself, that magnetic field collapses and induces 
a voltage onto that relay, which can cause your power supply level to raise up. So there's, there's techniques to deal with this flyback effect. And we'll look at flyback in the example video I'm about to show, but we'll also talk about how to deal with flyback in part two. Okay, let's look at a demonstration of an armature relay in action. And we'll do some measurements and we'll show what flyback looks like. So we'll also show what the internal parts of the relay look like. So here in this video, I'm showing three different armature relays. Different sizes relate to different power handling. So this largest one, the black one over here, can handle up to 36 amps. This middle blue one can only handle five amps and this orange one, I believe, can handle 15 or 16 amps, I forget. Now we're gonna look at an example using this orange one and I'm gonna control it with a power supply. But what I did is I ripped off the cover so you can actually see the internal parts of it. So I'm gonna flip the orange one over and you can kind of see the pins for it. You know, it's a through hole pin. And uh, basically these two pins, let me rewind the video. These two pins right here are the power. So you can actually apply the power signal plus or minus on either side. It doesn't matter. You just need to get that current flowing through the coil. And then these two pins are the input signal and these two pins are the output signal. And this is a normally open form A relay, single pole, single throw. Okay, so now we're looking at a relay here. So this is the same relay as that orange one I just tore off the cover. So you can see the coil inside right here. You can see these silver pieces are the armature and I'm gonna manually actuate it and then we'll actuate it with an electrical signal. But this armature over hits this metal plate which forces these, I guess these are brass or copper pieces to make contact. So right now it's open. When it closes, this piece will contact here. And I have a power supply connected to the power lines to send current through here to create the magnetic field to close the relay. I also have an oscilloscope to capture the flyback. And then I just have a DMM connected to the input and output that's making a resistance measurement so we can see when it open and closes. So first I'm gonna show you with my hand, I push on the armature and you can see that closes the relay, right? That's me manually doing it. Now I'm gonna to go to the power supply and then you see the DMM, it's open right now. So I'm gonna flick the power supply on. And there we go, the switch closed. It opened, closed, open. Now I'm gonna show it the DMM. It's so closed right here, low resistance, less than two ohms, open, closed. So there we go. So right now it's closed. So I'm gonna set up the flyback measurement. I'm gonna set up the scope to trigger off the flyback pulse. So first I need to close the switch because flyback happens when you re remove power. And then I'm gonna remove power and there it is. There's our flyback waveform. And so there it is. So the reason this appeared after I shut off power is because I had my trigger level on the scope set higher than 12 volts. And I should have mentioned these were 12 volt relays. So I was using a 12 volt DC signal to turn them on and off. And I had my trigger level set. So when I shut off the power, we saw the, uh, the flyback and that's what the scope triggered on and that's what we captured. And you can see there's ringing in the flyback. You can see it goes positive, negative, positive, negative before it finally settles down. So in part two, we'll look at how to deal with flyback. And also in part two, we'll look at some circuits that allow us to implement this switch. Because if you notice, I control this switch by turning power on manually with my hands up and down. But we want that to be done electrically with like a microcontroller test lead or something like that. So that's it for part one. In part two, we'll look at some simple circuit designs to implement the switch. We'll look at how to handle flyback and our focus will be on armature and read relays. And of course, after part two, I'm gonna have some exclusive content for those of you who follow me on Patreon. We'll look at some circuits where I'll implement them in hardware and give you access to those design files and the bomb, as well as some code to control the relays. If you think I miss anything, please use the comment section. If you have any questions from the video, please use the comment section. If there's any cool mechanical switches that I didn't cover in this video, please also use, suggest those or name those out in the comment section. All right, thank you for watching. I'll see you back here for part two.